Brother Douglas uh, presented one lesson already in the, this series on biblical preaching. Did an excellent job uh, at that time. And now then, Brother Douglas is going to be speaking on the subject of back to biblical attitudes. He and his wife, Lauren, he have two children. They are with us. He is working with the Beardstown Congregation in Tennessee. Uh, has received a degree from Freed Hardeman and has preached in many states along with uh, doing mission work. He's an excellent writer. Also, uh, he does an excellent job in imitating individuals as well. And so he, uh, but he does a great job in preaching the gospel. And we appreciate, appreciate him for that. Know that the subject on biblical attitudes will be a great benefit to us. Thank you, Brother Michael. I certainly love and appreciate Brother Hatcher and the elders of this congregation and the Bellevue Church of Christ very much. Again, it's a privilege to be speaking today on the topic that I have, and when it comes to attitude, I know at Bellevue you can always get reinforcement and encouragement. I was back in the break room, or as Brother Ken would call it, the tea room a while ago, as he was preparing his cupper. I decided not to get a donut, and he said, I said, I don't really need one anyway, and he agreed with me. I said, thank you, Brother Ken, for the reinforcement. It reminds me of a story an older preacher told me one time about a man, and I believe it was where he was preaching, and all of a sudden during the sermon he let out a big amen. And he was the kind of individual that he just didn't do that, or uh, hardly or never did it. So after the service, the preacher asked him, he said, why'd you say amen? He said, well, be stung, man, I had to say something. <laughs> so... But I'm sure uh, when it comes to the amens this week at Bellevue, it won't be because of any bees or wasps or anything like that. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Heard the story of two speakers one time. They went to a place to speak on George Washington. And one of them delivered a speech one night, and the people said, what a good speaker we've had tonight. The next one spoke, and the people said after that, George Washington must have been a great man. So we see which one of those speakers was the most effective. In like manner, in preaching Christ, we preach not Christ, but ourselves. And we're not up here, and I know the other good brethren speaking will agree with me on this, we're not up here to preach ourselves. We're up here to preach Christ. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. When it comes to attitude, we remember what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 11, In that we are to flee the love of money and covetousness and things of this nature, but there are certain things that we are to follow after, that is, to be in hot pursuit of. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. So to begin with this morning in dealing with biblical attitudes, I'd like to lay a foundation. Some things that must be in the foundation of our hearts and lives if we are to have the proper attitude. We know for one thing that we must love God supremely. As Jesus said in Mark 12 and verse 30, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And the second commandment likened to it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We know that to sum up all the attitudes or any attitude that we might have, it's summed up in the mind of Christ. The attitude that we have, of course, relates to our disposition, our outlook, the spirit that we have within us. That is, the kind of spirit that we have in us. 
And Paul said in Philippians 2 and 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. But there is something else that's very important to our subject this morning. And before I look at that, I'd like to say that attitudes help to determine our actions and our behavior, how we treat other people, and even our view or how we deal with God Himself. But the thing that we want to begin with is in the first chapter of the great book of wisdom of Proverbs, what the wise man Solomon said in chapter 1, verse 7. And in this verse, he gives two contrasting attitudes. That is, two kinds of people are represented here, or two different ways of life. And of course, it would involve two contrasting attitudes. The wise man said, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now there are two attitudes that are in contrast there. You have one, the fear of the Lord, the true awe and reverence for God Almighty, and secondly, that irreverent attitude and a very foolish one indeed, that despises wisdom and instruction. Later in the book, the wise man would say in chapter 9 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so one cannot attain to any true wisdom or knowledge without a proper reverence and respect for God. And today we see in our country this is a great thing that's missing, is the fear of the Lord. In Romans 3, Paul speaks to those who have no fear of God before their eyes. And that's one of the great foundational problems in our land of today. And then over in the book of Psalms, in 111, verses 10 through the last verse, through 112, verse 1, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in His commandments. And thus we see here that one who fears the Lord delights in the commandments of God. And that leads us over to what the preacher, the wise man, said in Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. A true reverence for God involves an attitude of obedience toward God. As the wise man said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Jesus warned us that we are to fear God and not to fear man. Now, if we fear man, then we don't fear God properly. It's just that simple. Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, there over in Westminster Abbey in London, England, written on a man's tomb are these words. He feared man so little because he feared God so much. And brethren, today, if we fear God properly, then we are not going to fear man or the future or the consequences that may come upon us for doing that which is right. We see in Jesus Christ a great attitude of obedience. In Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9, and of course, in that last verse, we see that those who obey Him are the only ones who have eternal salvation. Though He were a son, yet learned He obedience by the things which He suffered. And being made perfect, He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. Now going back here to the fear of the Lord in Proverbs 1 and verse 7, it may be of interest to note to us in the Septuagint translation, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that those translators use the word Eusebia in chapter 1, verse 7, describing the fear of the Lord, which is translated the fear of the Lord in our King James translation. Now, the important matter of that is that Eusebia is translated godly or godliness in the New Testament. And thus the Septuagint translators saw this connection between being godly and having godliness and having the fear of the Lord. 
Godliness or to be godly means to be devout. It denotes that piety which is characterized by a Godward attitude and it does that which is well pleasing unto Him. We note that Paul wrote to Timothy that bodily exercise profiteth a little. But godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. We know, moreover, that godliness is one of those Christian virtues that we are to add in the context of 2 Peter 1, verses 5 to 7. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Paul said, For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Of course, in the text here, we have the word godly and the word ungodliness. We are to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, but we are to live soberly, righteously, and godly. We know that the word for ungodliness here is from the Greek word asibia, which is the opposite of eusebia. And it leads to anomia, which is translated iniquity in the New Testament. What's the difference between ungodliness and iniquity? Iniquity is a disregard for the law of God, but ungodliness is the same attitude toward the person of God. And thus we see how that ungodliness leads to iniquity. And on the judgment day, that will lead to the Lord saying to a person, Depart from me, I know you not, you that work iniquity. Matthew 7 and verse number 23. We know that Jesus Christ loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 9. As we think, friends, this morning regarding these principles related to getting back to biblical attitudes, we go over to the book of Micah in the 6th chapter in verse number 8. This is a great statement regarding the kind of attitude that we should have in life. The prophet said, He hath shown the old man what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. What a great statement there. Yes, we are to be a merciful people. Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy in Matthew 5 and verse number 7. As we think about un ungodly people this morning, I would like to suggest to us that an ungodly person may be known as an outstanding citizen in our community. He may be very successful. He may even be very religious. Some may even think of him as a Christian. He may be an individual who is highly moral in a sense. Because ungodliness has to do with those who do not consider God. It doesn't mean they have to be fornicators, adulterers, murderers, and criminals and the like. But simply, they do not regard God. We find the sound advice in Psalm, the first two verses, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his life is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. We know in the Psalms the man is described of whom it is said that God is not in all his thoughts. The rich farmer in Luke 12 was condemned because he did not have God in his plans. He was very successful. He had declared that he would pull down his barns and build greater. But that night God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy so shall thy soul be required of thee, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So one who is not rich toward God is basically an ungodly person who is not Godward in their attitude. But let us consider when it comes to being godly and having godliness that this is the contented person. 
Paul said uh, from a Roman prison as he wrote there in the context of Philippians 4, 11 to 13, that I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. We know this because of what Paul said in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6, that godliness with contentment is great gain. So godliness and contentment go together. We see in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 5, the writer gives us the motivation for not being covetous. And we have a great problem of covetousness and materialism and lust for the things of this world today and even in the church of our Lord. He said, let your conversation, that is your matter of life, be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. So the key to not being covetous is to be content. But what's the key to being content? Verse 6, for he has said, here's the reason we should be content. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So the point is, if we have the Lord and He's with us, if we have God, we have everything. Why should we lust and crave for this world and the pleasures thereof if we have the Lord? But now let's consider another attitude or frame of mind or characteristic that relates to our attitudes and that relates to what we've just said also. And these are two things that follow one upon another, and that is humility and meekness. Just think about the many problems that we have in the church and in many congregations and throughout the brotherhood. If there were more humility and meekness, we would not have so many problems. For one thing, people would be content to accept God's will and to do it rather than trying to come up with their own way. When people are humble and meek, they are lowly. They are seeking to do God's will. And they are not seeking the preeminence one over another. Jesus Christ both had humility and meekness. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. What a beautiful statement the Lord made. The Lord came to preach the good news and the glad tidings to the meek. According to Isaiah 61 verse 1, as the Lord read from that in Luke chapter 4, there in the synagogue when He stood up for to read, Perhaps the idea is there that the Lord came to preach to the meek and lowly, but the meek and lowly are the ones who are going to receive His good news and obey it. James tells us that we are to receive with meekness the engrafted Word, which is able to save your soul, James 1.21. And thus the only way we can truly properly receive the seed of the Word of God is with a meek and humble heart. Parates, the Greek word for meek, Vine says on this word, it is an inwrought grace of the soul, and the exercises of it are first and chiefly towards God. It is that temper of spirit in which we accept His dealings with us as good and therefore without disputing or resisting. It is clearly linked with humility and follows directly upon it. Ephesians 4, verse 2, Colossians 3, and verse 12. And there in Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness. There's humility and meekness. With long-suffering for bearing one another, and then in Colossians chapter 3, and verse 12, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. So we see that lowliness or humility and meekness go hand in hand. I'd like to go to the Old Testament at this time to look at a man who characterized meekness. In Leviticus, the 10th chapter, verses 1 to 3. And they down and by he, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Well, obviously, they down and by you are not the ones I'm talking about. They lacked meekness and humility. 
And this is the reason they were so presumptuous to deal in the priesthood as they did. But the priesthood were those who were to draw nigh unto God and officiate in worship. Now these two men here were the sons of Aaron, the first high priest of Israel. They were the nephews of Moses, Aaron's brother, the leader of Israel. It's true, God is no respecter of persons. Acts 10, 34. That's true in our brotherhood and that's true everywhere else. It doesn't matter to God who we are, it's what we are in His sight and how we live. God is no respecter of persons. But now Moses says here in verse 3, and the Bible speaks of the great meekness of Moses in Numbers 12 and 3. Here was a man who totally depended upon God. It was Moses. He trusted the Lord with all his heart as we are commanded to do. And that involves humility and meekness. As the wise man said, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Proverbs 3 and 5. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. Nay, thou but abide you, do not glorify God in offering that strange fire. They did not sanctify the Lord in His name by being disobedient to Him. So Moses explained why God destroyed them by fire. But now the real character I want to impress upon us as being meek is Aaron. Look at the end of verse 3 there. And Aaron held his peace. He accepted God's destruction of his own son. He was bereft not of one son, but of two. He held his peace. Beloved, that's meekness right there. Aaron is called the saint of the Lord. Psalm 106, verse 16. The Apostle Paul is another example of meekness. As we know in 2 Corinthians 12, he had a thorn in the flesh. He besought the Lord three times that it might be removed from him. And this man, an apostle of Jesus Christ who had the power to heal others and did, could not even heal his own thorn in the flesh. And he besought the Lord three times that it might be removed from him. But the Lord did not grant him his request. But notice the meekness that Paul had in accepting the Lord's will. He, the Lord, said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul said that I will gladly glory in my infirmities. And then in verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's emphasize that meekness is not weakness. It is strength. Paul, when he speaks of weakness here, he's talking about his thorn in the flesh, his infirmity that he had, or whatever it was that was his thorn in the flesh. But meekness is the indication of true strength. Of course, the greatest example of humility and meekness that we have is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ Himself. Philippians 2 and verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We remember on the eve of the cross, that great crucifixion, Jesus prayed, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now this is the characteristic of a humble and meek person. One whose resigned attitude is, Not my will, Father, but thine be done. Thy will be done. That's the theme of a godly person's life. That kind of a person has the right attitude. The story was related one time that a lady asked old brother McGarvey, where was God when my son was killed? And brother McGarvey replied, I don't know, unless he was in the same place that he was when they killed his son. Friends, as we think about meekness, 
It is only the humble heart which is also meek, and which as such does not fight against God and more or less struggle and contend with Him. This meekness, however, being first of all a meekness before God, is also such in the face of men, even of evil men, out of a sense that these, with insults and injuries which they inflict, are permitted and employed by Him for the chastening and purifying of His elect. In the words of Trench, and did not the Hebrew writer say, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth? The humble, the poor, the meek describes the intended outcome of affliction before God, namely humility. In Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 12, I will also leave in the midst of being afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. Jehovah God said. Now, we think about these poor people here that the Lord will leave in their midst. Those people were not poor in the most important sense. They were poor, meek, and lowly. And the Smyrna Christians were poor, but they were rich, Revelation 2 9 says. And so this is the intended outcome of affliction that we might have this kind of poverty here. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. We have a contrast in people in the book of Zephaniah as we look at chapter 2, and uh, rather chapter 3, verse 2. She obeyed not the voice, she received not correction, she trusted not in the Lord, she drew not near to her God. But then in chapter 2 and verse 3 of that same book, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought His judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. This morning as we think regarding meekness and humility, it is the attitude of mind and behavior which arising from humility, George Rickerberry says regarding meekness, disposes one to receive with gentleness and meekness whatever may come to him from others or from God. Paul said to the Corinthians, I beseech you by the gentleness and the meekness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 1. And one more comment on meekness. It is equanimity of spirit that is neither elated nor cast down, Vine says, simply because, it's an important point here, it is not occupied with self at all. Now look at another attitude in contrast to that. And that's in the book of Jude, verse number 8. And my friends, I truly believe this is one of the root problems we have in the brotherhood today. Jude speaks of these filthy dreamers. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion. They hate authority. They despise dominion. And speak evil of dignities. So the contrast of the humble and obedient soul are those who despise authority, even that of God, over them. I'd like to turn now to the prodigal son in Luke chapter 19, uh, chapter 15 for just a moment. Notice the change in this man's attitude as he left home and then he came back. We notice that when he left home, he had the attitude uh, before his father, Give me that which I deserve. Give me that which I deserve. In Luke chapter 15, verse 13, and not many days after, or verse 12, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Give me my share. I deserve that. And he divided of them his living. And then we know this young man ended up feeding the swine. And would have fain filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. Then he came to himself, and then he arose, and he went to his father. And when he returned, his attitude was, I am not worthy. Beloved, we need that attitude more in the church. Among preachers, we need it. 
among members when needed. I am not worthy. Jesus commended the man in Luke 18 and verse 13 as being justified who said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me. The prodigal son returned and he said, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Jesus connects this attitude with humility. In Matthew 23, verse 11, He that is graced among you shall be your servant. He that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Verse 12. The son returned, he wanted to be a servant. I'm not worthy, just make me a servant. Wouldn't it be grand to have more members of the church with that attitude? Just make me a servant. I'm not worthy. James chapter 4 and 1 Peter 5, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Peter said that we are to be clothed with humility, 1 Peter 5, 5. James 4, 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Do we have enough humility and meekness? Would we have less problems if we had more of that? Before we close here in just a few minutes, love and appreciation. We need more love and appreciation. Look about that woman over there in Luke chapter 7. Jesus said of her that she loved much because she had been forgiven much. Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, he said to Simon. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. He said to her, Thy sins are forgiven thee. Thy faith is saved thee. Go in peace. The point here, if I understand this correctly, is not that Simon and the other Pharisees didn't have a lot to be forgiven also. But you see, in her mind, she knew she had a great weight of sin on her soul to be forgiven. And beloved, we've got to realize that too. We've all been forgiven much. Do we love much? John said we love Him because He first loved us. 1 John 4.19 He also said, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5.3 Love will make our burdens lighter. Maybe we've heard the story about the 15-year-old boy carrying around his little crippled brother all over the place. And someone said to the 15-year-old, Isn't he heavy? Carrying him around all the time like that? And he replied, he ain't heavy. He's my brother. He's my brother. Love will lift our burdens. We see a contrast in attitude among many members of the Lord's church. The story was related by the late Brother Guy in Woods, who's a famous gospel preacher that many of us love and respect. That his father was very elderly before he had ever, ever had to miss a service of the church. But on that first Lord's Day, when the elderly Brother Woods had to miss the service, they said he just broke down and cried. You know, it seemed like some people cry when they have to go to services. But this man had love for the Lord. David was a man after God's own heart, Acts 13.22. He had that attitude. He said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, 1. A lady one time asked me in the church, she said, where in the Bible does it say, I have to go to church on Wednesday night? You know, we might point out these Scriptures to her. And where Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. If we love Him, we will want to do His will. Now let's take our attention back to the book of Genesis for a moment. In chapter 29 and verse number 20, 
This is the story of uh, Jacob laboring for Rachel, whom he loved, who wanted to marry this girl. And uh, a great statement here, a great principle in this verse. And we know that he labored for her for seven years. And verse number 20, And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. Now there's the attitude of love. He loved Rachel. The seven years seemed but a few days to him because he loved her so much. Isn't that the way we should love one another as husband and wife? Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. Ephesians 5.25 And the wife, of course, to love her husband and her children. Titus 2, 4 and 5 And love, loving our children, our parents, and the husband and wife but let's transfer that to an even higher thought. Shouldn't we love the Lord that way? If you think a person who really loves God, you're going to have to tug and pull and push them through the doors of the church building and come to service. Or to pray to God every day. To study the Word of God. To go out and do good to others. To try to win the lost to Christ. And do anything they can to bring glory to God in heaven as Jesus taught we do by our good works in Matthew 5.16. And then when we come to the end of this life, we can say it just seemed like a few days that I had to serve in the church because of the love that we've had for Jesus Christ. I would like to close my friends this morning in Philippians chapter 2. Because in the mind of Christ, we see every good attitude, every biblical attitude that we need to have. In the mind of Christ, we see a mind of obedience. In the mind of Christ, we see a mind of servitude. In the mind of Christ, we see a mind of willingness to suffer and to sacrifice. In the mind of Christ, we see a mind of humility and meekness. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not right to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Following the humiliation, the sacrifice, and the suffering, we read, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. Beloved, this morning, we're going to have to go through that suffering and sacrifice and obey God and serve. Then we can say we will have the glorification with God. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Romans 8, verse 18. Thank you.